and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and today I have an extra special treat for, for you guys in the audience because uh, once again I'm joined by two special guests. So in the first place I'm, I'm joined by uh, ID proponent Dr. Michael Behe. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you. Excellent. And we also have someone who's been on the show before uh, who, who's also a amateur ID expert, I would say, uh, and a, a huge fan of, of Behe, uh, Marvin Wallace. Welcome back to the show, Marvin. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me on the show, Dale. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be with uh, Michael. Perfect. So, so as, you, as you guys can guess, I, I've been promising the, the audience uh, sooner or later to, to do a show on the, the incredible evidence from intelligent design um, compared to evolution and naturalistic evolution. So um, that's the, the plan for today's show. Um, but uh, yeah, just before we actually get into the topic, maybe very quickly, you know, five minutes or less or something like that, um, can we just get an introduction to each of the guests? So starting with you, uh, with you, Mike, um, you know, give us sort of an introduction as to who you are, maybe a little bit about your faith journey and, and what interests you in intelligent design. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I live in Pennsylvania and uh, and I was born in Pennsylvania, too, <laughs> so I haven't traveled very far from where I was born. I was raised in Harrisburg. I'm a Catholic. I went to Catholic schools. I was taught Darwin's theory and stuff in Catholic schools and told it was not a problem uh, because if God wanted to make life by just regular laws, then, you know, who are we to tell them different? That was always fine with me, so I never really had any... Uh, particular problem with evolution, um, but I was interested in chemistry, and I studied chemistry at uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, and, and I kind of got into biochemistry while I was studying chemistry, and so I did my graduate work at University of Pennsylvania on in biochemistry and studied sickle cell hemoglobin, which is a fascinating <laughs> topic. I'm sure the listeners would like to hear a lot about it. <laughs> but uh, then I went on to do a postdoc, and, and um, uh, finally I'm, I'm here at, at Lehigh University, where I am a, um, a uh, professor of, uh, in the biological sciences department. I became interested in intelligent design in the late 80s when I read the book Evolution, a Theory in Crisis by a, an Australian geneticist uh, named Michael Denton. And uh, reading it, I was totally taken by surprise because he was uh, pointing out problems for Darwinian evolution that I thought you know, didn't exist. I, I had never thought much about evolution. Uh, and I was um, shocked. And since then, I became very interested in evolution. And uh, it doesn't take long from doubting Darwinian evolution to come to the conclusion that intelligent design is a much more likely answer, simply because of the fantastically complex systems that biochemists have to uh, uh, have to study every day. And um, after that, kind of through a series of coincidences, I became publicly involved in the discussion about intelligent design and, and Darwinism. And I, I wrote a few books about it over the years, and, and that's where we are today. Perfect. All right. And, and Marvin, uh, as, as the other guest on the show, I, um, just maybe give like a quick introduction um, as to who you are for, for anyone who hasn't heard you on the show before. Um, and yeah, why are you interested in the subject of intelligent design? Oh, great. Uh, my name is uh, Marvin, uh, as, uh, as we've established. I um, have an MA in apologetics from Biola University uh, in California. Um, I'm studying um, courses towards a, um, a higher um, degree in philosophy at Southern Evangelical Seminary at the moment. So I'm working towards that. What got me interested in um, intelligent design was that I read, I, I read um, 
a book by Philip Johnson. And I was kind of shocked about with how common sense and how compelling the argument arguments were that um, Philip Johnson had given. Uh, even though he wasn't a scientist, he was, a, I believe, um, a lawyer. And um, since then, I've, I've sort of interacted with people who have alternative schemes uh, for evolution and human evolution, and um, even some Christians who have not been very positive about it, but yet I remain kind of convinced that at heart that it's a good, uh, it's, a, it's just a makes good sense and um i have good science as well yeah it's going to be a, a great show here um so let's uh, get straight into the the questions here so so mike um turning to you with the the first question on topic uh, maybe just give the audience in general what what exactly is intelligent design and and how does that relate to you know mainstream evolutionary theory um and also within the intelligent design movement, um, are there different views? Okay, yeah, the very good questions. Uh, a lot of people get confused, uh, but intelligent design and mainstream evolutionary theory kind of treat different questions. Uh, evolution, as it's understood by most people, is, is a broad, um, you know, kind of usually poorly defined and word, but in almost all of the scientific community, it means evolution where all life descended from some distant common ancestor and did so by some random, unintelligent, non-directed uh, process. And Darwin's mechanism of random mutation and natural selection is the chief candidate for that. So. It's not usually said explicitly, uh, although Darwin uh, insisted upon it, but uh, it, it is meant that evolution is not guided or programmed or influenced by any intelligent being whatsoever, pointedly including God. Uh, again, D Darwin himself ins assisted, insisted, I'm sorry, <laughs> Uh, on this. On the other hand, uh, intelligent design is the study um, of things, usually in nature, um, that are better explained as the results of purposeful intelligent design rather than, uh, rather than random uh, unintelligent processes. And um, that is has a different goal because it doesn't worry about things like common descent. Uh, one can think that the designer, uh, you know, let his design unfold over time, was actively influencing it, had it programmed to do what he wanted or, or, or whatever. And the question then is, how do you detect design? I mean, uh, how, how do we know that something is designed? And uh, I've written in my books uh, about this. Uh, people generally seem not to realize that even though they uh, detect design things every day, many times every day, and uh, the uh, way that one detects design is when you see a purposeful arrangement of parts. Uh, that sounds obscure, but just think of something like, say, a mousetrap, uh, which I've also used in my books. When uh, it's got parts to it, it's got wooden platform and various metal parts. Now, it's not a pile of parts, but the parts are shaped and put together and held in place by staples and stuff in a particular way so that they are oriented to each other to allow them to perform this function, a purposeful arrangement of parts. And pretty much all machinery is the same thing and lots of other things too. Now, uh, the thing about this is that intelligent beings can have purposes. Unintelligent processes do not have purposes. 
So when we see that, uh, and let me add that, to the extent that an intelligent agent can manipulate parts, then the agent can arrange them to fulfill his purposes. And being intelligent folks ourselves, we can oftentimes perceive the uh, purpose in the arrangement of the parts, just like that dumb mousetrap. Uh, well, it turns out that the more and more, uh, you know, it was obvious from the beginning that the parts of living things are arranged for purposes. But when Darwin came along, people started to doubt that and, and uh, wonder about it. But the more and more we know, especially as science probes at ever deeper levels of life down to the molecular level, the more and more fantastic and elegant and sophisticated arrangements of these things do we, do we find. And uh, so the point is that uh, intelligent design looks for intelligence. It has a different ex explanatory <laughs> duty than evolution does mm -hmm. and yes within the intelligent design community we have a range of views particularly on the idea of common descent i'm probably on one end i grant total common descent for purposes of argument that is i'll happily say yeah okay let's let's postulate that all life descended from a single common ancestor now tell me how you know how could uh, random processes do that. And it's been my experience that even that small uh, disagreement is enough to uh, bring every all the Darwinists down on you like a ton of bricks. But there are other folks in intelligent design who uh, do not think universal common descent is true and and are um, uh, draw the line at, at different places. And there are uh, some folks who are uh, uh, young Earth creationists in the intelligent design movie. So, of course, they think the Earth is young and most things were created uh, as they are. So, yeah, we, we're a big group and we, uh, uh, we, we're happy to welcome anybody who thinks uh, that you can, uh, that design can be detected uh, by physical properties uh, in, in life. The next question comes from Marvin, so I'm going to uh, turn it to Marvin to ask you about that. Thanks, thanks, Dale. Uh, my my question for for Michael is, um, I'd like to to kind of ask, in what ways the extended uh, evolutionary synthesis differs from traditional Darwinism. So, what kinds of um, scientific phenomena exist now that just can't be um, can't be um, uh, attributed to those basic traditional Darwinian um, drivers random mutation and natural selection okay yeah that's an excellent question for uh, listeners who haven't heard of it before uh, there's uh, debate about including other phenomena or other mechanisms into evolution that Darwin didn't think about or didn't consider much or have been discovered since uh, since his book was written. And um, I, I guess I should add that, interestingly, I would estimate that pretty close to half of biologists are searching around for an explanation for evolution uh, different than Darwin's theory. So that uh, the when you read in newspapers and magazines and other places that, oh, science uh, is resolutely behind Darwin's theory, that's, that's not the case, that there is a lively debate about exactly how evolution works. But Almost all folks in the extended evolutionary th synthesis also uh, observe the rule that hey, there is no intelligence allowed. <laughs> whatever, okay. whatever okay. is going on, it's got to be uh, unintelligent, random, undirected, and and so on. 
Yeah, so uh, a couple of the extended evolutionary synthesis is kind of a name for a ragtag bunch of different theories that are united pretty much by their uh, just being different than, than Darwin's theory. Uh, for example, there is one called uh, a niche construction, niche, N-I-C-H-E, you know, little place construction. And the folks who, um, who are um, uh, proponents of that say that, well, you know, Darwin's uh, theory says that the organism has adapts to the environment uh, and the environment selects, okay. the environment selects for uh, their uh, traits. But with some uh, organisms, the organisms themselves shape the environment and live in the environment that they construct for themselves. And I, I think one of the best examples of this has, uh, is one that has been popularized by a fellow named Scott Turner, who's a biologist at State University of New York, and he studies termites. Uh, not, yep. <laughs> not the ones in your yep. home, but the ones that, yeah. uh, uh, the big ones in Africa. And uh -huh. there's one, one species that builds these humongous uh, termite hills 30 feet high. And he goes through yes. and says that yeah. they live in these things and they adapt to them and they're, uh, they build them so that they maintain temperature, maintain uh, constant temperature, maintain constant uh, amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and all sorts of things. So he says these structures... Uh, future generations of termites have to ad adapt to the structures that past generations built. And so the interaction between environment and organism is a lot more intricate than Darwin uh, considered. And then there are, there are um, new processes at the molecular level of life that Darwin knew uh, nothing about, since he didn't know anything about molecules or about <laughs> genetics. And one is called epigenetics. epigenetics and yeah. epigenetics is this discovery that DNA, which is supposed to be the <clears throat> carrier of genetic information, can actually be chemically modified by other molecules in the cell. And so that its sequence of nucleotides, which is supposed to direct everything, actually changes. and the, and the uh, molecules which put groups on DNA, you know, essentially have the power to turn genes on and off. So, again, the question is, who's controlling who? Are these epigenetic factors controlling the DNA? Is the DNA somehow controlling the epigenetic factors? And, again, things uh, appear to be a lot more convoluted than, uh, than Darwinists would have you believe. And... You know, in my opinion, these folks, and there are a couple other, uh, um, there are a couple other branches of the extended evolutionary synthesis too. But again, they're not really related so much to each other. They just joined in their opposition to Darwinism. In my, okay. in my view, none of the proposals of the extended evolutionary synthesis uh, answers the uh, questions that intelligent design puts to these things. You still have the problem of where did complex structures come from? Epigenetics and niche construction don't say anything about, say, the bacterial flagellum, this marvelous molecular machine that uh, I kind of featured in my first book, Darwin's Black Box, uh, which you know, is so sophisticated and needs so many parts to work that it's clearly uh, clearly requires an intelligence to put it together. None of the mm -hmm. new proposals in the extended evolutionary synthesis deals with that stuff. So these folks, uh, in my view, the uh, the ones supportive of the <coughs> extended evolutionary synthesis, see the problem for Darwin, uh, but they are hobbled by the fact that they don't want to go to the obvious solution, which is purpose, real purpose, real teleology, 
real intelligence yeah. in in nature. Yeah, thank you. So 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 Darwinism uh, still does the heavy lifting, you would say, for those extended evolutionary uh, folk. Would you say they tend to focus on salient aspects that can't be answered by Darwinism itself? Um, for example, um, horizontal gene transfer, but still rely on uh, Darwinism as, a, a, as the engine of driving change in uh, biological systems. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, let's see, yes and no, I guess. <laughs> yes, they, they all rely on Darwinism to do the heavy lift, lifting. That is, uh, termites, you know, how do you get the termite in the first place? Well, that's mm -hmm. left unexplained. Uh, and, and by kind of uh, presumption, you get to cells, you get to multicellular organism, you get organisms with eyes and senses and so on by Darwinian processes. That's what mm -hmm. is the uh, premise, I guess, of uh, the extended evolutionary synthesis. If for uh, for uh, epigenetics, the machinery of epigenetics, which is extremely complex, proteins, systems of proteins, I mean, where did that come from? And again, the uh, unstated presumption is generally that, well, Darwinism got us there. But then you say to yourself, well, if Darwinism is so cool and could get us all these complex things, why should we be so stingy as to say it can't uh, do anything further? And that's pretty much the argument yeah. between Darwinists and the extended evolutionary synthesis proponents, the Darwinists say, well, you know, the stuff you're talking about is just a little bit beyond, and uh, we can happily include it in Darwin's theory, and maybe there are some processes that we should consider on their own, but as long as it's pretty much unintelligent uh, processes that... Um, that uh, are being talked about, then you're still within the neo-Darwinian uh, ah, okay. Okay. house. Yeah. So live options have to be unintelligent. Exactly. And, and if okay. they're unintelligent, then, then they can easily be assimilated into Darwin's idea. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I want to turn the focus um, to the next question. That was a great, great exchange, both of you guys there. Um, but Apart from the science, so uh, Mike, you're you're going to be well familiar with this criticism. Me, me and Marvin are are both familiar with it in, in interacting with atheists and skeptics on the boards and that sort of thing. But there's this obstinate saying that intelligent design is not science; it's just theology, it's philosophy, and it can be simply dismissed out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to turn it to you. Do you think that intelligent design theory? Uh, does have any theological or philosophical uh, bearing at all, um, or is it just pure science? And also, what do you make of your your experience with the Dover trial? Didn't that prove? Look, ID is just a bunch of bunk. It's not science. It's it's religion. Okay, that's that's a couple of good and questions that are that are in fact uh, widely asked, and um, my view is that intelligent design is pure science. Uh, it fits nicely with, just within science. But yes, it does have philosophical and theological implications because discoveries about the universe, how the universe works, can have uh, such implications. They make you wonder, uh, you know, why is it this like this? How did, you know, what does this imply? Uh, and uh, when we talk about other topics, everybody in the world you know, understands that. For example, the Big Bang Theory, uh, which was proposed in the 1930s or so, everybody thinks that has theological, maybe philosophical uh, implications. Even quantum theory, uh, where uh, physicists say that a particular particle can pop into existence and out of existence and uh, can't be in any particular place. You have to measure it before it gets 
into a particular place, that has philosophical implications too. Nonetheless, quantum theory and the Big Bang theory are themselves pure science. I think the same thing for intelligent design, that it's uh, the stuff I do anyway is, is pure science. And what I mean by science is that it is based not on some revelation or scripture or any such thing, but it's based on uh, empirical observation of the physical world, the world we can see and measure and so on. Uh, so all of these molecular machines that I talk about, the DNA with its sequence and its uh, signals and so on, all of those are physical things that we can uh, that we mm -hmm. can uh, talk about their structure, just like the mousetrap is a physical thing. And uh, so ID uses physical evidence plus normal logic, uh, the same kind of logic that other branches of science use too. People forget that science itself requires mind. You've got theories. Theories aren't physical objects. You've got evidence. That's not physical object. You've got reasoning. That's not physical object. So uh, ID uses logic and reasoning to say that whenever we see parts uh, put together uh, that have some clear purpose, we uh, can be confident in concluding that it was done by an intelligent agent for reasons I said earlier, because intelligent agents can have purposes. Uh, unintelligent nature does not have purposes. So yeah, so yeah, the I guess the bottom line is that I consider ID to be a scientific theory that has theological and philosophical implications like many other scientific theories too. With the Dover trial, uh, uh, <laughs> a Dover trial for those uh, folks who uh, are younger than me, uh, took place in 2005 in, in Harrisburg, uh, which is where I grew up. I thought, hey, this is will be a great chance to, to visit my parents while I'm at the trial. I, I was a witness uh, at the trial, and it involved a school district in central Pennsylvania uh, putting a book that discussed intelligent design into the school library and, and letting uh, students know that it was there and say, you can read it if you want. And that turned out to be a federal case. Uh, believe it or not. But anyway, the judge decided uh, completely against intelligent design. Uh, he said that it's, uh, it's dumb, it's, it's pure religion, it has pretty much nothing to recommend for it. Uh, and on the other hand said, you know, uh, Darwinism science, uh, it's practiced by noble scientists, that it's, it's, uh, it's the best hope of mankind. Uh, but uh, I was, you know, upset by the ruling, but later on it transpired that the opinion of the judge, which was very long, 150 pages or so, uh, all of the relevant parts that had to do with ID, the science, and any non-legal topics was copied from a document given to him by the ACLU, uh, who was brought in to help um, help the plaintiffs against the school uh, school board. So uh, it turns out that in the legal profession, both sides give documents to the judge and, uh, and telling him how they wish he would rule. And they're not supposed to, but this judge did copy the exact word for word into their opinion. So the long and the short of it is that he just signed off on the other side's wish list and mm -hmm. There is abs absolutely no evidence that the judge understood any of the technical or academic arguments at the trial. 
by either side, by the intelligent design side or by the uh, Darwinian side. Uh, mm -hmm. And I discussed this in the um, uh, in several places, including uh, I have some essays on the Internet and the latest uh, book I've written uh, discusses uh, it in the appendix. And uh, so the long and the short of it is that he displayed no understanding. He didn't raise any, you know, he, the document contained all the standard objections that Darwinists have, which I have answered many, many times, and that a trial, a court trial by a, 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 an English major uh, uh, judge is, is no place to try to decide uh, intellectual issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, um, just so the audience knows, I'll, I'll provide links in the sources. Um, so on discovery.org, uh, he's got some, some articles about his experience with the Dover trial and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, perfect. Um, so, so Marvin, I'll, I'll turn it to, to you to ask the next question then. Yeah, and, and be, before I answer that, ask the next question, I'll just point out that uh, one of my old teachers, J.P. Moreland, uh, in his book uh, on scientism, looks at the document uh, from the Dover trial and is quite uh, critical of um, the language that was uh, signed off on in so far as it's um, an example of scientism. So mm. um, that's, definitely, that's definitely worth a look. Mm. Uh, as you suggest, let me now ask the next question, please, Dale. Okay. Sure. So, how ought we to identify instances of intelligent design in general uh, within the field of biology specifically? Are there multiple valid ways or sets of cr criteria to do so, in your opinion? For example, um, irreducible complexity such as yours, Michael, or or um, uh, Dembski's specified uh, complexity. Uh, could you answer that question? Sure. Um, I, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, all I, I, one can say that uh, intelligent design is recognized by the purposeful arrangement of parts. And that in life, there are so many parts and they're so elegant and they interact with each other in so many ways and, and to such a depth that I think it's difficult to try to go in and point at that and uh, point at one thing and say, yeah, oh, that's, uh, that's clearly designed. But over here, you see this, this is clearly not designed. Problem is not the positive conclusion so much that something is clearly designed it's the negative conclusions you can get a lot of false negatives where you think something doesn't have a purpose and it's only because you don't know what the purpose is or you don't know okay. everything that it interacts with and so on i think a much better way to approach this uh topic is not that way but to ask what can undirected uh, processes do in life? And there's a great experiment that's been going on for the past 30 years, which I uh, have written about a lot uh, by a really good scientist named Richard Lenski at Michigan yeah. State University. And he said, well, you know, what I'm going to do is just let some bacteria called E. coli grow in my laboratory. And I know that when they copy, when they uh, reproduce, they'll copy their DNA and sometimes they'll make mistakes, in other words, mutations. So I'm just gonna let them go grow for generations upon generations and look back to see how they've changed, what evolution has done. And it's a wonderful way to approach things, especially since the bacteria grow rapidly, they go through six generations a day, so that over the 30 years, he's well past 50,000 generations of bacteria, and they grow in huge numbers, trillions of them, uh, so you get enough 
uh, data to have really statistic, statistically great, solid results. And he has shown that in with after uh, tens of thousands of generations and trillions of bacteria, the top 30 genes that he has identified, which helped the bacteria adapt and grow faster and get better under those conditions, the top 30 genes or mutations, I'm sorry, were in genes uh, and they caused them to break. They, okay. in other words, they broke genes okay. that had already been there or they degraded them, made them so that they couldn't work as well as they used to. And in, in some instances, throwing something away or breaking it helps. Uh, I use the example of, you know, if you want to get better gas mileage in your car, the fastest way to do that is to lose excess weight, take off the doors or throw out the hood or, and, you know, those, uh, those things are useful. But if your life depended on your car getting better gas mileage, then uh, getting rid of all that stuff uh, would be the way to go. So point is, you know, can Darwin's mechanism build anything at all? And um, I'm tending, to, I didn't think so 25 years ago when I wrote my first book, but now I'm tending towards the answer uh, to that question of, no, it can't build even the smallest interacting molecular features of life. So this is a long way of, of saying that uh, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that, you know, pretty much 99.99% of things in life had to have been designed and okay. that the random process that processes that Darwin identified can break some stuff and that can actually spread help a bit and spread through a population. And we have mistaken that uh, for positive uh constructive changes great all right uh yeah and uh Mar if you don't have a, a follow-up uh, on that marvin um I, I just want to turn it to you so you'll take on the role of a guest here if do you mind just uh quickly giving your brief take on on the way ways that we can identify intelligent design and and that sort of thing was that question directed to me dale yeah, if, if you don't mind, you don't have to if you don't want to. But uh, could you could you could you say that question again, please? I, I just wanted to turn it to you to get your take because I, I know this is a an area of specialization yeah. for you. What what do you think are some of the ways that are good ways to like, positively identify intelligent design in, in general versus the field of biology? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm with the guy who wrote the book, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's just no, I don't let's just let's, spy. We, you don't let, have to answer. Let, yeah, let, I, I will just say say this: the the idea that um, things were were intelligently designed um, has always has always been it, skeptics skept, skeptics kind of tout that as a weakness in sort of a, a theological worldview, should you hold that, that kind of view? But it just kind of dawned on me um, a while back that um, the, very, the very kind of antithesis of saying that things are intelligently designed is to say that they were brought about by chance. And that's just no hypothesis at all. So I've sort of moved from almost buying the idea that was touted by skeptics that um you know the idea of idea of uh, intelligent unless you can show the designer blah 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 it makes no sense so kind of flipping that on its head and just thinking do we really want to sort of postulate that this whole um, gamut of biological complexity and biodiversity came about by plant by chance i don't think so i think that's the more how could you put it um wild hypotheses or hypotheses by far well i'm with you it's okay it just it just sort of you know you got those moments and some some kind of idea hits you and you think this can't be chance right and chance can't be a better hypothesis than design how can it be 
Thank you, Marvin. I, I appreciate switching the roles on you there. So yeah, thank thank you for giving your your contribution on that. So all right. Um, so so turning back to you, Mike, um, on the next question, um, maybe we can get into some specifics now. Can can you give us some specific examples um, of intelligent design within within the field of biology that you think are particularly good examples um, of intelligent design itself and Okay, um, sure. Um, all you have to do is open a biochemistry textbook and every page you'll see examples of intelligent design. But uh, in, my, in my first book, I wanted to wow people with, you know, uh, things that are just overwhelmingly uh, elegant and, and so on. And uh, one of the first ones I talked about was the bacterial flagellum, which I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, and but I don't think I got to explain this flagellum. Flagellum means something like whip. And in the 1800s, some folks with these with microscopes saw that some bacteria had this little hair-like thing uh, in the back, uh, in their on their on the cell and in the back, and they could swim around and. Later, better microscopes showed that, in fact, this hair could actually turn. And nobody thought of anything about it, you know, a little hair that turns, you know, whatever. But more and more as science advanced, particularly after World War II and into the 60s, 70s, 80s, more and more work was done on this. And it turns out that this flagellum thing is quite literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim around. It's got a propeller, which is the whip-like hair. It's spun around and around by a, a drive shaft that's attached to a motor, which uses a flow of hydrogen ions into the cell to turn it. There's something called a U-joint uh, attaching the uh, uh, the uh, the propeller to the drive shaft, and the U-joint transmits the rotary motion of the drive shaft, which occurs in one plane, to the rotary motion of the uh, propeller, which is in another plane. Uh, and um, this U-joint, uh, we people... <laughs> We humans have made them, and they're kind of these clunky things that, yeah, you can uh, rotate in one direction, and then uh, something attached to it rotates in a different direction. But recently, just a couple of years ago, that uh, uh, some scientists using a much newer technique show that the piece on the bacterial flagellum, the U-joint there, is this ultra-sophisticated thing that uh, compresses on one side and expands on the other side, uh, unlike, uh, much, much more elegant than the uh, mechanical things that people have. Uh, so that's one example, uh, sophisticated machinery. Another example is uh, the information in DNA. Back in uh, the 1940s, uh, scientists were scratching their heads about how does genetic information get uh, transferred from one generation to the next. And uh, they didn't know about the role of DNA at that point. Uh, but one scientist, actually a physicist, suggested, well, maybe there's a code that transfers information. And uh, people kind of thought that was dumb, you know. <laughs> Whoever thought of, of a code being made up by chemicals? And yet, mm -hmm. after Watson and Crick showed the structure of DNA and the genetic code was cracked in the late 1950s, people realized that there is this genuine, no kidding, code that signals the cell with an arbitrary sequence of nucleotides, units in the DNA, to put a particular amino acid, a unit of a protein, uh, at a particular place in the sequence of the protein that's being built. And since then, uh, there have uh, 
uh, other codes have been discovered in the cell. And codes, essentially, they're just signals that will tell the cell, okay, put this thing over here, or take this over there, or, uh, or turn this gene off, or this gene on. So <clears throat> the point is that codes and information come from intelligence. And, uh, and we've discovered those to an astounding degree. Uh, the only response from uh, Darwinists is that, wow, look, there's lots of information there, uh, but we know it's it's not intelligent. So I guess it's not really information. It, it must be something. <laughs> yeah. So, right. uh, you know, it, it's really strange that, you know, uh, when confronted with something that's obviously, you know, light years beyond what you'd expect of an unintelligent process, uh, the Darwinists say, wow, you know, evolution is even smarter than we thought. Um, and yet in the experiments, like I discussed for the last question or so, uh, yeah. you see nothing like this. You see destruction and degradation and, and so on. Uh, so those things, there have been uh, many other things uh, discovered in the past 25 years. Uh, one of my favorites these days is... Uh, something called bacteriophage T4, which is a virus that infects bacteria. So since we're all suffering from COVID-19 uh, problems, uh, um, people relate to viruses these days. And uh, this uh, is one that's been investigated quite a bit over the decades. And it turns out that uh, the bacteriophage T4 is is really a uh, smart, uh, automated, mechanical syringe for injecting DNA, the phage's DNA, into a cell. It's got wow. these long legs. The structure itself kind of looks like a lunar lander or something. And it's got these long legs that when they touch the right site on a bacterium, trigger other shorter legs to unfold they had been folded up into the structure they unfold and grab tightly onto the bacterial cell now when that happens it triggers the contraction of this long tube-like structure and as it contracts a needle a molecular needle inside of it punctures the uh, membrane of the cell and dna the dna of the virus was stored in this geometrical structure in the head it travels through the hollow tube down through the needle and is injected into the <clears throat> into the poor cell now it it takes thousands and thousands of, of proteins and and of many many different types to do this and yet they all work for the one purpose of transferring the dna into the cell so, uh, and, and these days, uh, scientists who study it make movies of these things, and there are movies placed up on the internet, uh, which show this in action, and, and you, would, you have to see it to believe it. it it's really crazy, really uh, uh, impressively uh, designed. Uh, so, uh, these, are, these are, at the molecular level, these are, uh, as persuasive as, uh, of cases of design as outboard motors in our everyday world or lawn mowers or, or other such things that we immediately recognize to be designed. Um, so, like I said, but you know, t on every page of a biochemistry textbook, you'll, you'll find uh, great examples of, of intelligent design. Excellent. Yeah, uh, uh, Marvin, do you, just before we go to the next question, do you have any uh, follow-up uh, questions or comments about those specific examples? Uh, that, that was good. I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, if Michael, you would like to comment on uh, this COVID-19 um, RNA virus, if you'd like to say anything about it in terms of, does it look to you like, like something could have, that, that could have been uh, manufactured in a 
laboratory or something like that. I know it's a little bit conspiratorial, so uh, yeah. you know, just 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 a sort of a uh-huh. uh, a, a pointer. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're, you're well, um, me myself, I haven't seen any convincing evidence of that, and it doesn't mean that it didn't happen because. You know, intelligent agents can hide their designs, make them look like they're random. But, you know, uh, uh, I, I haven't seen anything convincing. But mm-hmm. what I do know is that I think that viruses as a group were indeed designed. The machinery mm-hmm. of COVID, the machinery of bacteriophage T4, that's clearly really sophisticated. And some people worry about that, saying what kind of a designer would make COVID-19 or Ebola virus or things like that. And the answer is that, well, uh, we're kind of, we might be being, you know, self-centered when we put it in those terms, because viruses uh, are very widespread in the world, and they do many, many things. Uh, and so their purpose uh, might is likely not to uh, you know affect humans. Rather, it's to play some critical roles in the biosphere. But every now and again, uh, some accident happens. Maybe a mutation happens, and uh, a virus that was happily doing other things uh, gets the ability to infect humans and we suffer from it, but that doesn't strike me as any, any uh, different from, say, somebody, uh, say, some of the, uh, somebody, you know, 3,000 years ago going out for a walk away from the village, and a tiger encounters him and eats him, and, you know, tigers have, you know, roles in nature, they're, they're dangerous, so you want to stay out of their path, uh, but they're clearly designed, they're magnificent animals. Uh, I think we're just learning more and more, and it and kind of gets us by surprise as we go along. Mm-hmm. So I think viruses are positively designed and not designed specifically to hurt us, but they can sometimes when we meet up with them in the, in the wrong way. All right. So uh, I want to ask the, the next question as well. So so we kind of touched, uh, I know in your answers um, to Marvin's question about the extended evolutionary synthesis, we, we've kind of touched on new mechanisms at play, but maybe uh, do you want to just give us sort of um, an overview of kind of the historical development in terms of the, the, you know, the various naturalistic evolutionary mechanisms that have been proposed to be at play and, and how that has changed over the years and, and developed and that sort of thing. Um, and also, um, I'm curious, you've written uh, a great book, which, which I own and, and love. It's one of my favorites on the topic, The Edge of Evolution. Um, what, what, based on the, what we know, currently know about the evolutionary mechanisms, what seems to be this edge or this limit that they can do in, in accounting for the evolution of life? Okay. Um, okay. Well, we can start back with uh, evolutionary mechanisms and uh, uh, before Darwin uh, in the 1700s and so <coughs> excuse me people started speculating about uh, a great uh, tree a uh, great uh, ladder of life that there were simple creatures and slightly more complex creatures and a little bit more complex and uh, up to plants and simple animals and more complex animals and up to us and then up to angels and then to God. So it's the, uh, the uh, idea that all levels of complexity are represented from the most sublime to the most ridiculous, say. And, and um, so uh, then people started to think that, well, maybe some of these organisms derive from one another, uh, but the mechanism, if you want to call it that, the reason uh, was always some teleological um, explanation. For example, um, uh, one uh, uh, French scientist, whose name escapes me now, 
uh, propose that when animals strive to do something, they kind of push their bodies and change them, and it becomes, uh, uh, they change them, and those changes can be inherited. For example, with giraffes, the the yeah, yeah. big example is the giraffes. What's, it, what's that fellow's name? I forgot now. Uh, he's, he says that giraffes' necks got longer as they strove to eat leaves high in trees. I'm sorry? Um, uh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, uh, yeah, are you yeah. thinking of Lamarck, John Baptist Lamarck? Yeah, Lamarck, yeah, very good, yeah. Lamarck, yeah. So uh, he, he is a precursor of Darwin, and, and Darwin's own grandfather talked about some teleological ways. But Darwin's claim to fame was that he thought up a completely unintelligent, non-teleological -tele um, process for producing life that uh, that has dominated uh, people uh, scientists didn't think much about it after he first proposed it in the late 1800s early 1900s they didn't really have a substitute but they thought that his idea wasn't so good nonetheless the very proposing of a mechanism for evolution for the production of life which was fully scientific which left god out of the picture and religion out of the picture appealed greatly to scientists and from then on they only entertained ideas which did not have teleological um, edges to them mm -hmm. and um so and and people continue to propose different things and we talked about the extended evolutionary uh, uh, synthesis but in uh, in the meantime in the past few decades we have gotten experimental results and data which bear greatly on these questions and which show that undirected natural processes can't do much of anything and uh, I, I wrote chiefly uh, about this chiefly in the edge of evolution which we did, uh, were nice enough to mention a few minutes ago and uh, the main example I used was the development of resistance the evolution of resistance to the dr to the drug chloroquine of mm -hmm. the killer disease malaria uh, listeners may not know that malaria is actually caused by a single-celled organism that is transmitted by mosquito. When a mosquito bites us, it transfers the bug into our bloodstream. And uh, when another mosquito comes along and bites the infected person, it can take the, it transmit the uh, parasite to somebody else and chloroquine was, was this drug that killed malaria dead you know it was really great it you know, a person sick with malaria uh, very sick could be given this drug and in a day or so they were cured they were done with the malaria but wow. after about after about a decade of using chloroquine uh, people thought that malaria might be able to be completely eliminated from the earth but uh, a after a decade or so, resistance started to pop up, and uh, it eventually took over the world. And now chloroquine is a is generally not used for malaria anymore because there's a good chance that the malaria would be resistant to it. But if you look and you ask yourself, you know, how did the malaria re evolve resistance? Did it make a nice new molecular machine? Did it develop new genes? Did it, you know, get uh, a new kind of molecular motor, a, a brand new, something analogous to a flagellum or something? And it turns out, no, that in in these this decade or two that it took malaria to evolve resistance, there were many, many malarial cells that were exposed to chloroquine, you know, uh, 10 to the 20th cells, which is a huge number. That's more than the number right, of stars right. in the Milky Way. And it turns wow. out after, after all those opportunities, 
the resistance was due to two crummy amino acid changes in a single protein that had already been there in the malaria cells. So uh, the long and the short is that we now have the ability to get data that are very relevant to these naturalistic evolutionary mechanisms. And what we've gotten uh, shows that uh, the natural <laughs> evolutionary mechanisms can't do much at all. Uh, very, very, you know, tiny uh, changes in pre-existing structures. And you're, you're right that there have been objections to this edge, and most of them uh, ha are of the nature of, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, that's dumb, you know, <laughs> but nothing substantive, nothing su you know, people kind of wave their hands at this and that, but if you go to the trouble of looking up some of the papers that they cite, they have nothing to do with it. They might s suggest the exact opposite. Um, and so in my completely unbiased opinion, people just don't want to hear about it. Darwinists just don't want to hear about it. And so they pretty much ignore it. And since their community is large enough and it's got the cultural high ground. They don't have to respond uh, to it. That's, it's, it's funny. That's uh, obviously I'm not a, a scholar or scientist like yourself, but I think Marvin would agree that on a layperson level, when we're interacting with atheists and skeptics, I find the same attitude of, of just dismissing and not wanting to actually yeah. get into it and deal with it. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, it, it's a tough. It's a tough one. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so now, uh, ahead, now Mike. we now we know how. Uh, what's her name? Um, um, Cassandra felt. <laughs> you know, remember the, the Greek uh, 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 figure Cassandra? I, I forgot whether she was a demigod or something. She would she would warn people of of various maladies coming their way, and they and the curse on her was that she. would Tell them, should warn them, but nobody would believe her. <laughs> so oh, sure. I, I understand now how she feels. <laughs> I, I, I look that one up, Cassandra. Okay. Uh, okay. Kind of like Noah's too, as well. But perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Marvin, just before I turn it to you to ask the next question, um, did you have any quick uh, like follow up uh, questions or comments? Uh, no, that was great. That was that, that was, was great. great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, go, go ahead and ask question number eight. Then. Yeah, My, Michael, what are the biggest uh, or most formidable options, uh, options, sorry, objections to intelligent design? Um, for example, uh, one that we heard a lot about in Hong Kong, I'm in Hong Kong, and wow. we um, ha have something called the Science and Faith Study Group. About 10 years ago, we were studying um, the edge of evolution. Uh, sorry, we were talking about Dar uh, Darwin's black box and um, co-option came up. Ken Miller's um, critique. Um, would you would you like to comment on that or or any other? I think that's sort of the major objection to it to your um, formulation of um, intelligent design that I hear. How would you respond to that? Uh, well, uh, co-option uh, for listeners is is the idea that, well, maybe some piece of biology or a gene or something that's been doing some other job in the cell and life, uh, in some circumstances, you can duplicate it and maybe use a copy to do a different job. So the, uh, and that's called co-opting. You take something that was already there and and use it for something else. And it's an interesting idea, and you do see lots of things in biology where uh, they're very similar to each other, but they're doing different things. And uh, so the temptation is very great to say, well, you know, this one was just co-opted and some turned into that. And the uh, explanation of co-option works best when you don't ask any questions beyond that. Uh, when you don't say, well, how exactly did that gene uh, come to have this other job? Uh, if you have been, uh, you know, uh, if you have a mousetrap 
and uh, Ken Miller, you know, takes off a piece of it uh, and uses it as a tie clip. Is it really a plausible thing to say that mouse traps descended or could be uh, trans uh, could be um, transmuted into um, tie claps could could be transmuted into mouse traps by some random Darwinian process. And if you look at it in detail, almost all of these stories are just uh, another just so story. There is a, a, an oft repeated one uh, about the bacterial flagellum. Remember that uh, we talked about that a, a few minutes ago. Which this bacterial flagellum is this elegant outdoor um, outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. Well, there's kind of a similar looking structure, does not have the long whip uh, propeller portion to it. But it it acts as a kind of like the uh, kind of like the bacteria T4 acts. It it is used by some hunter cells to inject poison proteins into prey cells that kills them and then they get eaten. And it turns out that the uh, the bacteria flagellum has to build itself. You know, outboard motors in our uh, world do not build themselves. Intelligent agents do. But the flagellum has to build itself, and it does so because it's got this hollow tube-like structure, and it's got a pump that can pump the components of it, and it pumps them in a very specific order, and they assemble themselves on the outer portions of it. And so uh, people, including uh, Ken Miller, who's a biology professor at Brown University, said, well, hey, uh, look, this, this, uh, this type 3 secretory system, this needle, this pump, it's called the type 3 secretory system, you know, maybe, you know, that's that's a simpler, uh, it's a simpler uh, machine than the flagellum. So the flagellum is not irreducibly complex, they'd say. And maybe this apparatus could be turned into a flagellum. Uh, so here we have a wonderful example of an evolutionary intermediate uh, that, uh, that um, shows these claims of irreducible complexity to be uh, wrong. And you say to yourself, well, exactly how does that show it? Because uh, nobody explained where this type 3 secretory system, this needle complex, came from. Nobody shows how it could be turned into a rotary motor. Uh, nobody has shown anything except to say, here's this other structure that uses components similar to these found here. And so we will assume that one is related to the other by random mutation and natural selection. In fact, um, if, if you look at the type 3 it, a secretory system, it doesn't have the ability to turn a, uh, a rotor. It doesn't have the ability to turn a propeller. What would you know, what small steps would you, you know, take uh, to build that thing? The, the uh, function of pumping proteins into another cell has absolutely nothing to do with the function of uh, a rotary propulsion. It's like saying, well, we found this, uh, uh, we found this washing machine that has, you know, some a semblance of uh, or some resemblance to this other thing. So therefore, you know, the washing machine was probably a precursor to a flagellum. But the washing machines have nothing to do with uh, rotary. Well, they do actually. <laughs> but anyway, I, I guess I guess you know the um, the main point is that the invocation of um, the invocation of co-option is not an explanation. It's simply a observation that one thing looks like another, and it doesn't explain at all how the one thing 
turned into the other or the other thing turned into the first one or they arose right, independently right, right, or right. or any such such thing kind of yeah if, if you have a follow-up I, 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 follow I, I, no, I was just gonna I was just gonna make a point sort of it's like identifying wheels on a car and then then saying well that's how a jumbo jet flies uh yeah something like that or e even a bike even a bicycle and a motorcycle you know e e when you get down to the wires and connections and stuff which is what you would have to do if you were an unintelligent process trying to build one from the other it doesn't work you know even things that look real similar to each other when you look at them seriously you find that it's real real hard to see any way that a an unintelligent process could transform one into the other. And lately, and in my newest book especially, I think that in fact, many of these variations for the flagellum itself, there are actually variations of the flagellum in nature. That is, some are more powerful than others. Some use sodium ions instead of hydrogen ions. Some are thicker, some are thinner. I think that even, even those variations very likely required purposeful design. That design extends very much further into life than even I previously would have thought. Uh, I write in the book that even this very simplest molecular example of cooperativity, something called a disulfide bond, uh, where two amino acid residues in a protein called cysteines can form a chemical bond between them. Even that has Darwinists stumped. So it's kind of like saying, you know, listen to, listening to some braggart say that, you know, yeah, he can high jump, you know, 12 feet, and then he stumbles trying to get over the curb uh, at the side of the street. Uh, you know, there's no reason to believe that uh, Darwinian processes can do uh, much of anything at all. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to sort of quickly follow up on that because I, I I've heard I've heard these these same objections since you you know since the early two thousands when you guys were were going on and and that sort of thing. But I'm just sort of curious. Do do you find that there are any efforts um, by evolutionists and Darwinists to kind of update so so you for example do respond to the objections and you give detailed counter responses are there is there the same effort to kind of give counter counter responses are, are they updating the objections based on the latest research or are they still stuck in the the 2000s period in, in your view yeah they're they're s stuck they yeah. don't build on uh they don't build on the initial response that they give to me and uh, as a matter of fact, they don't even pay attention to my responses to their responses. As a matter of fact, for my latest book, Darwin Evolves, which just came out a year ago, it was reviewed in Science. And these reviewers, there were three of them, uh, and they brought up objections that I had uh, responded to you know, 20 years before then. Uh, and they acted as if, and they said, be he just ignores these things. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, had, I, had, I had written, you know, thousands of words on, on each of the things. And, and many of the, you know, some of the examples that they cited, I had cited in my own work as showing, you know, the opposite of what they were claiming for it. I think the purpose of these reviews and the purpose of things like Kenneth Miller wearing a, a mouse trap as a tie clip is not to actually contribute to knowledge or the discussion. It's just to give uh, other people something to gesture at and dismiss uh, intelligent design proponents. Uh, it's not a serious engagement. It's, it's kind of an exercise in you know cultural uh, <laughs> cultural power to yeah. say you know uh, well Ken Miller or Richard Lenski or somebody else has written in science or nature that you know this is this is just 
silly. And and look, there is this uh, uh, there is this uh, multiple mutation syndrome that hey maybe that had something to do with it. And you look up this thing they they invoke and it has nothing to do with anything. And but nonetheless, there it is now in an official journal by a hotshot scientist. And so people say, well, they must have a good response to it. And people are trusting these guys to be uh, engaged to treat this seriously. And they're pretty much, you know, being subject to a scam. They're not uh, dealing seriously with the issue. Uh, the objections they raise have either been answered or have good answers or uh, some such thing. So it, it's a very <laughs> it's a very depressing look at our world. I imagine it goes on in places outside of science too. That uh, folks uh, simply won't listen to reason when it uh, goes against their own interests. Marvin, I'll, I'll turn it to you to ask the, the last question, um, and I'm, I'm keeping us on time, so perf um, so, so yeah, go, go ahead. This was a, a question that you wanted to raise, Marvin. Um, yeah, what do you think uh, the future for the IDD movement looks like? Are there newer uh, areas of research? Are yeah. there any ways? Are there any ways in which you think the design inferior uh, inference might be extended? Well, I, I think the uh, future of intelligent design looks very, very uh, bright. That is, pretty much every week, uh, science is discovering brand new, sophisticated, incredible systems that are that the week before we didn't know existed, and now we know are critical for life, and life couldn't exist without them. Uh, and the more we know about life, the more and more and more uh, compelling is intelligent design. But that's the science. The science is pointing uh, insistently to intelligent design. What exactly the scientific community and scientists in general will do, whether they will now tolerate intelligent design at some point, point in the future. That's more of a sociological and political question. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like saying, you know, uh, when is the Soviet Union going to fall uh, back in the 1930s? You say that, well, it's doing a crummy job of, you know, building society. When's it going to fall? Who knows? You know, it depends on many, again, human factors that uh, are beyond uh, prediction. Uh, so the short answer is intelligent design is, is doing great uh, based on the evidence, uh, but humans decide what ideas they'll accept or entertain and which ones they won't. Right. Uh, the, the design inference can be extended uh, a lot uh, into various areas every time a system, a new system is discovered, people ask questions, though, that say things like, well, since the cell has this system, that means it would need this or that or the other thing to support it or keep it under control or things. And, and people would then can then go and, and see if those things exist. And oftentimes they do. And that is that's design reasoning. Uh, one can also extend design reasoning into medicine, uh, where you say that, well, we know these random processes, uh, you know, micro Darwinian evolution are problems for viruses infecting people. So we will uh, outsmart them and we'll say we'll make it so that the virus would have to mutate at an impossibly uh, uh, impossibly bad odds to overcome the drugs that we're going to give somebody. And that's what people did with the HIV virus. Instead of giving one right. drug where you can uh, perhaps mutate against it, that they give a cocktail of drugs which act in different ways and the virus can't get the simultaneous mutations it would need to overcome those. And so it's a, it's a good treatment. 
so you can use intelligent design reasoning uh, in lots of ways in, in bio, for biomimetics, that is manufacturing materials that are inspired by what we find in life, the, the sophisticated materials that life uses. And, and we can use the edge of evolution to try and, and um, combat uh, infectious diseases. And uh, so there's lots of stuff uh, that one can do. But again, uh, the big drawback is that all of this is done by people and people have, <laughs> have their faults. And uh, so it's, it's hard to predict. But the bottom line is that the more we know, the, the much, much more uh, obvious it becomes that we are uh, what they call fearfully and wonderfully made uh, down to our toenails, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. That does it for the for the list of questions. I, I hope that uh, both you and, and Marvin had a had a great time on your guys' end. Oh, yeah. fantastic! Same here. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Absolutely excellent. And Marvin, great on you for being my my co-host uh, on this. You did a great job. Uh, as, oh, as my pleasure. Excellent. All right. Uh, so perfect. So, um, I do, is there anything that uh, Mike that you think we missed that you just want to bring up, or did did you want to just have like a closing statement to give any plugs that you wanted, or? Uh, no. Well, um, one plug is this that uh, we talked about how uh, our uh, answers to objections get ignored. Well, it it turns out Discovery Institute is bringing out a book, a, a compilation of my essays and responses to all the objections over the years. So I, I'm excited about that because it'll, it'll provide a, a single source to point to. And for folks who have been in conversations with these, uh, with folks who, who talk about Ken Miller's uh, tie clip and uh, type three secret story system. So that's coming out in the fall. Uh, so, uh, listeners, if they're interested, could keep an eye out for that. Perfect. All right. Well, yeah, ha have a, a great week. Uh, again, I thank both of you guys for being on. It, it's been an honor getting this important information out there for people to, to really dig in. And, and, you know, don't just go for the superficial answers. There's there's some substance here. And I want, I want you guys, whether you're atheist or Christian, wh whatever, take a look at this. I mean, there, there's some great information here. So um, yeah, ha, ha, have a great week. And yeah, th thanks again to, to Marvin and Mike. Okay, thanks, Dale, for, for putting this on. And Marvin, thanks, thanks for, Dale. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. All right, take care. <laughs>